Hey, power people. Welcome to Renewable Rides. I'm Gareth Evans. And I'm Dan Roberts. We're the founding team of Vecta, a platform and marketplace streamlining how companies buy on-site energy. In each episode, we'll uncover the latest trends, challenges, and triumphs relating to the energy transition through the experiences of our team and our inspiring guests. Our goal is to help companies take action to create a resilient, profitable, sustainable, and thriving energy future. Let's go. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Renewable Rides. And today, Dan and I are honored to be joined by Tim Eccles, who is... Um, been 14 years with the Georgia Public Service Commission and uh, is father of seven. He's been married for 40 years, which is awesome. I think we've all got a lot to learn from Tim on that front and uh, is the host of Energy Matters with Commissioner Eccles, uh, which is an awesome podcast, which you should all check out and uh, founder of Team Pact. Tim, huge amount for us to dig into today. Welcome. Yeah. Great, great to be with you guys, and uh, nice to be on the other end of the microphone. I'm normally on your end of the mic, so it's great to be interviewed. It's a, it's a, it's easier to be interviewed than it is to do what you guys do. Uh, well, we love it, and uh, really excited about what's going on in Georgia and what you've been involved in, and hearing your perspective on it all. But before we get into the energy world, we'd love to know on a personal level, what are you passionate about? You know, I love my kids and. Uh, keeping up with my kids. I've got a couple of grandboys coming this summer. So that, that'll be four total grandboys. So hanging out with those grandboys, teaching them, you know, little things, maybe that, you know, that the, the whole world is new to them, right? So taking them to the aquarium, to the zoo, teaching them about, uh, about energy, uh, you know, there's just so many things. So I'm really excited about my, my grandkids these days and what's going on. Uh, of course, you know, I love my clean energy roadshow I do here in Georgia. We do this every summer, travel around the state and introduce people to alternative fuel vehicles. And of course, my day job of making sure the Georgia grid is ready, ready to rumble for anybody that wants to come into our state and do business. It's a big, uh, big job. And uh, as, uh, as, Fathers of, of boys as well with Gareth and I. We know the craziness of, uh, of a bunch of little boys running around. Um, well, Tim, uh, can you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, your your role? Like, how did you get here? What, what were you? Have you always been in, in kind of this this public environment? So uh, maybe a little background there would be great. I've always loved politics. I mean, I got elected to my first office when I was 14 years old right? Sophomore class president. It was a competitive race. I was the underdog. I was running against the captain of the cheerleading squad. And so to beat her, uh, it was like, it was like, yes, this is incredible. Uh, and so I got elected the next year to the, to the vice president of the school and then the, to the president. So, and then off in college, I was also involved with you know, the various clubs and leaders, leadership roles. Uh, so I really, I really wanted to be in elect, electoral politics. I, it, I was just having to wait till I raised my kids and, you know, and, and built team packs, some other things I was doing. And finally, this opportunity opened up when I was 49 years old and I ran for the Public Service Commission and I beat uh, three other Republicans. And then uh, and then in the general, I won as well. So politics is so much about about the moment and the opportunity, right? Looking for a seat that you can win. It's not just a matter of like, you know, being passionate and having the right ideas. You have to, you have to wait on the right moment um, so that you have the greatest chance of winning the seat. And then once you get into a seat, you may have opportunities to, to springboard up to other, other areas. I've been in this role for 14 years I don't necessarily have a desire to do anything else. I might, I might, if a congressional seat opened up or something like that, there's a chance I could run for that, but I'm very happy with this role and and I would be happy just to keep serving as long as I could as the commissioner. And for those that don't know much about that role, Tim, like what does a day-to-day -day look like? What are you responsible for? And that, like, how do you measure your success? It does vary from state to state. I was just with uh, regulators from 17 different foreign countries. I was over in Poland 
um, really just encouraging the Poles and the Bulgarians who were trying to build the same kind of reactors that we built. Uh, but uh, they are federally appointed there. They're not running for office, where in the U.S., 11 states regulators have to run for office. They may run in a district or they may run statewide. In Georgia, we run statewide. Where states like North Carolina, Florida, New York, Maine, California, those are appointed by a governor. So I often tease and say that those states get smarter regulators, right? Because if you're governor and you're looking for someone to reg regulate energy, you're going to, oh, okay, I'm going to go with that Harvard guy. I'm going to go with that that MIT guy, and you can just pick them and put them in there. And they serve an average of about 4.3 years. But states like Georgia, uh, the engineers, they don't like to run for office. Engineers do not like that kind of a life. <laughs> so, so you don't get engineers in the job. You get people like me, liberal arts majors who you know, have a master's in public relations and, you know, radio show and you get people like me. And, and so it's a little bit slower learning curve for someone like me. It took me two years just to figure things out. So, uh, so yeah, I've been in the office 14 years, but my first two years was like, you know, I was in kindergarten. Love that. I think there's a huge value to that, though. I think particularly on the energy front, actually having a lot of incumbent knowledge and seeing how the system's been built for 100 years isn't necessarily the right foundation to be thinking about where we should be going. And so I think having that clean perspective is super valuable. Yeah, certainly, uh, you know, being able to go to plants and go to universities, meet with professors, meet with, uh, meet, meet with NGOs, meet with people that really have a lot of expertise in these areas, that's really helped me and trying out the technology. I mean, it's why I've had seven electric cars and, you know, a natural gas, you know, Honda, a, a, a CNG F-150, a propane van, solar on my house, solar thermal on my house. I mean, I, I just felt like, you know, I've got to try this stuff out, experience it, because it, it's not perfect. None of this stuff is perfect. Uh, it, it, has a, it has a duty cycle. It has some specialty uses that you can really take advantage of, but I, I wanted to know both sides of it. And I love helping ratepayers in Georgia and others kind of see how the technology works so that they can make a good decision on whether they need to employ it themselves. Yeah, no, I, we, we appreciate that, all the work that you're doing. I think for, for our listeners, what can you can you give a couple of specifics about? So, as the the Georgia uh, Georgia uh, Public Service Commission, your job is to is to watch over uh, the the utilities in the state and make sure that they are 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 following the rules. But maybe can can dive into a bit more details yeah. there. So, think about the right of way out here, where there's a utility poles, there's gas lines, there's fiber, anything on that right of way. We have something to do with it. Uh, so it began way back in the day with uh, with uh, train tracks. Train tracks were on a right of way. They put telegraph lines along the train tracks, uh, and then and then you had gas lines, electric lines, and so a lot of these governments just simply kept piling this stuff onto these public service commissions or public utility commissions, and some of the companies had territorial monopolies. And so they needed to be regulated. Others, uh, as we deregulated like rail in the U.S. in 1961, as the phones got uh, de deregulated and all the bell, the bell systems were broken up, then we weren't regulating them completely anymore. Uh, so the utilities in Georgia are still fully regulated. Um, Georgia Power, we, of course, have a rural cooperatives and they're owned by the members and then some cities like College Park and Dalton and others have their own utility, but we do have some authority over all of them. Uh, but the m most of the authority that we have is really directed at the Southern Company through their units of Atlanta Gas Light and Georgia Power. We fully regulate those two companies. Got it. Got it. Thanks for the the, the background there. Um, well. 
I would love to to dig in. I think Georgia's in a in an extremely unique position in the in the country. It's a, it's really exciting. We've Gareth and I have had the fortune of of spending a lot more time in in Georgia over the last couple of years. Uh, fortunately, one of our investors is is based there, and and uh, and, and several of our customers are. But um, so we've been we've been tracking closely, and with the 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 reshoring of manufacturing with the explosion of data centers um really it's caused uh, from what we've been reading and, and you're going to be closer to this than we are but it's caused georgia power to to increase their load growth projections we've seen anywhere between 400 megawatts which seems very low up to 6.6 .6 gigawatts but how, how is georgia power planning to to meet this arguably explosion in demand well they thought they were only going to need 400 megawatts um uh, you know, when, when we did the last IRP in 2022, uh, but since that time, all of this data center load growth kind of materialized, not just speculative load growth, but companies who said, we're coming, we need the power. Um, so you think of Bitcoin mining, you think of data centers, you think of heavy manufacturing like Hyundai, 200 megawatts of uh, you know, of, of use down there. I was at the Atlanta airport yesterday. Their backup system that they've got with just generators on the ground, 65 megawatts backing up the Atlanta airport of of diesel generators with 100,000 gallons of fuel sitting there ready ready to go. And Georgia Power is involved with all of that uh, out there. Uh, and their people are on the ground working every night, basically from about one in the morning to five in the morning. So uh, the 400 turned into 6.6 .6 gigawatts to, to your point. We approved 6,600 megawatts of power to be built, you know, by 2029. And then next year, probably around January, Georgia Power will bring us a fresh integrated resource plan with the load growth needed for 29 through 31. And we're anticipating another 8,000 megawatts, another eight gigawatts of power. So that's pretty substantial. It's about seven of those nuclear reactors. Um, and so obviously you can't build even one more of those reactors by the end of 2031. Uh, it's just too short a time period. So we're going to be, wow. I, I mean, we're, we're doing an all source RFP request for proposal where we're we're going to hear from the solar community. It's going to be a lot of solar plus storage. I'm sure there's going to be some gas bit into this. I'm sure there's going to be some biomass bit into this. Uh, who knows exactly what this is going to be. There may be some wind turbines somewhere we could acquire that are sitting idle. Um, and we just don't know until we crack it open and put out that RFP and then look at all the bids uh, or the requests to see what folks can do. And from the commission and from your perspective, Tim, what what is your vision for providing this reliable, clean, and probably most importantly, affordable power for your residents and business members in order to meet this demand? Like, what do you see that future looking like? We've got the central grid today. There's huge opportunities around more distributed energy resources, microgrids reducing central demand load through being more optimal in managing demand side, having more flexible resources. Like, how are you thinking through this complex dynamic uh, minefield? You, you know, my vision doesn't really matter uh, because we're going to be putting out these proposals and we're going to be comparing these things, these, you know, these bids. So I would imagine that solar plus storage comes in about as cheap as anything. Uh, so I am expecting a lot and we have plenty of room for solar. I mean, we've got probably less than 1% of our land that have panels on it, maybe even just a half a percent of land. So uh, th there's a lot of opportunity um, for solar. The Southern company owns a gas company. So uh, I, I have to imagine they're going to be bidding in some gas units. Uh, the, the gas is, you know, is plentiful, and the Mitsubishi turbines that we're operating are extremely efficient. So I, I think that we're going to see some bids for that. Um, batteries are a huge thing. So when you add batteries to a large solar field, like I was at this morning, it's at a hundred megawatt, you know, field of about five hundred acres 
uh, you know, a panel, 600 total with all the equipment, you, you add 100 megawatts of batteries there and you've turned that energy only asset into something you can count on. So batteries do have kind of a magical quality like that. I think we're going to see some hydrogen eventually here in Georgia. Uh, it, it may be just displacing more transportation fuel, like with class eight semi trucks, um, forklifts, Amazon's using it, BMW's using it up in South Carolina at their plant. But there's a chance you could blend some hydrogen with natural gas. Uh, I, I'm not sure how all of this will pan out. Right now, hydrogen really can't compete financially uh, with, with anything at a power plant. So, you know, I, I do anticipate solar plus storage and I would really love to see us build a couple of more um, reactors. Uh, we've got room for them. We need the energy and we've got the expertise in now building a uh, Westinghouse unit. So it would make sense if we can get some kind of federal backstop, some kind of catastrophic insurance against a bankruptcy. That's, that's the missing piece that I have to have to vote for it. I've got to have protection for ratepayers. And frankly, I don't want our ratepayers on the front end of the cost on this. Uh, data centers need to pay more than their fair share on this. They're the new load. They're the new people in town. And if we're going to have to be scrambling to get generation for them, I think they need to pay the lion's share of it. Yeah. Um, it's an extraordinary amount of power. So what I'm hearing is all options on the table. Let's we want to we want to hear hear everything, and and it's going to have to be a mix of everything. But uh, I'd, I'd love to to spend a, a couple minutes hearing more about the Vogel plant. The the Vogel plant is is the first nuclear plant to come online here in the U.S. in in 30 years. Uh, it's a huge deal. Kudos to you all for for really driving that forward. I know it's it's taken a long time. Um, uh, in, in studying up, uh, uh, it's taken a little bit longer than anticipated and, and certainly double or so the cost. But um, walk us through kind of that process. It just came online in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and, and what are going to be the impacts, um, both positive and negative, uh, if any, for, for uh, Georgia ratepayers? Yeah, if, if you think about the three big things that this plant had to overcome, I mean, initially, the Japanese tsunami um, you know, um, the verified tsunami that hit that country that destroyed a nuclear facility out there had a ripple ripple effect across uh, the world. Uh, and Westinghouse had over 24 of their reactors in the order book uh, to be built. And after that event, all of those disappeared except Georgia and South Carolina. That's how devastating that was in terms of morale, public opinion, fear. Um, and I mean, if you're building 25 widgets and now you're only building four, well, you're, you know, your cost have gone up. Uh, you were counting on some scale there. Um, so first we lost that. And then Westinghouse uh, had been bleeding cash and Toshiba, their parent company in Tokyo, bankrupted the Westinghouse LLC in America uh, really just for one reason, is to get out of the contracts that they had with us. So that, when they, when they bankrupted Westinghouse, all the protections that had been built into this highly uh, negotiated contract were gone. Um, so like, for example, uh, uh, any kind of over who was going to pay for the overruns. We were only initially responsible for $2 billion of overruns, but, uh, and the contractor was going to have to pay for the rest. Well, all that went away. So, so South Carolina decided to throw in the towel after, after the bankruptcy, we decided to keep going. Um, we had more customers than they did. We thought we could withstand it. And then the pandemic hit and you know what, you know, the impact it had on just about every kind of business in the world. Um, and yet, you know, with COVID testing and masking and everything that we had to do with 9,000 workers working in a fairly tiny area, we, we, we overcame that. So if you look at the, the tsunami, the bankruptcy, and, and the pandemic, 
and you go, and you guys still finish that? I mean, that's, it really is amazing that we ever finished it. <laughs> so a lot of the naysayers who were critical of the overruns, they, they're not saying anything anymore. I mean, there's still a few out there. But I think people recognize what an incredible engineering feat it was to accomplish this. And yeah, it was it was more expensive. Total rate impact on Georgia Power ratepayers, 12%. So for the average customer, it's probably about $15 a month. But it is more than likely an 80 or 100 year asset. And we've estimated that at about year 32, it will break even. So uh, it's, it's got a 40 year license. So, um, so, it's not unlike my solar that I'm going to break even at about eight years. Um, so, um, so it's it's uh, it's a, it's a reasonable investment. It was a great deal when we started, and it really just you know worked out to be a, a so-so deal. Um, but here's what here's what I do know: we need the energy, and I'm glad we have it producing as we speak. Um, uh, producing those two units, 2,200 megawatts, 24/7 of clean carbon-free power. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Could not have come online. I mean, earlier probably would have been better, but to see the, 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 the curve of, of load growth um, and the inflection point we're hitting at this moment uh, is, is quite a, quite a fortuitous time for it to come online. Um, and so, so the, the impact I'm hearing from, from you uh, on rate payers is just going to be a, a kind of a, a one-time 12% jump, which is, which, Given the, the 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 unfortunate cost overruns through the things that you you mentioned is is not a huge impact. Are, are they should they expect any other um, increases from this plant? No, actually, the impact on the Ukrainian the the Ukrainian spike um, for the gas caused by the Russian boycott of you know when Europe boycotted Russian gas and started buying American LNG. That was a $16 impact on the bills, and Bogle was about 14. So, the the only difference is the Ukrainian impact on the on the gas will drop off uh, in another 22 months. So that 16 will go away. The Vogel stays there forever. Uh, yeah. So, it, it it you know once that 12 percent was baked into the rate base, then it's not going anywhere. Rates essentially permanently went up by 12 percent. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I am curious, Tim, because you've been been along for most, if not all, of this ride. Uh, you, you didn't have a crystal ball when you guys started this, and you couldn't see Fukushima coming. You couldn't have seen the the pandemic coming. Knowing what you know now, would you do it again? I would only do it again if I had a federal backstop against the bankruptcy. We we never dreamed that a company with as much stature as Westinghouse and Toshiba, that they would actually use the bankruptcy law to break a contract. So now that I know they would do it, that means someone else might do it too. So for me to vote to build another reactor or two, I'm going to need something that takes that into consideration. Uh, And so that's something that the Department of Energy could do. Uh, the loan office could do it. Congress is probably going to have to act to reshuffle some of the IRA, mo- IRA money to create a kind of a, a, a nuclear overrun fund, maybe a $50 billion fund that, say, the first five states, the first seven states that decide to build nuclear would have access to that if they had a catastrophic overrun. Got it. Tim? I think this is a great example of it takes time to bring these large facilities online. And so the strategic planning you and Georgia Power are doing is critical. I think as the load continues to grow at the the rate it's projected and knowing that these projects can take anywhere from three to 10 plus years to permit, build, bring online, whether it be solar, wind, nuclear, et cetera, um, for commercial industrial businesses within Georgia and those moving into the region, some of the pain points we're hearing is, I want to be operational quickly, but I can't get access to energy, or I'm worried that energy prices are going to go up. From a on-site energy behind the meter perspective, 
what is the opportunity? What programs do you have? And what is your kind of a sales pitch to businesses who are within the state or wanting to move into the state? You know, the utility doesn't really want people to build behind the meter, right? They want to sell them power. So they're not out there volunteering, you know, to help them do this. But savvy companies uh, know that it can be done. Maybe they've done it in other parts of the U.S. or other parts of the world, and they simply come over here and maybe replicate that. Maybe they add some solar on their roof. Maybe they add uh, some uh, additional generation. I, I would, uh, you know, coming back from this solar field that I was at today, uh, passed by international paper on the Flint River in Montezuma, Georgia. They make diaper fluff. So think about your baby diapers and that soft padding in there. That's actually made from pine trees. Okay, uh, so it is. It is. It's, it's been worked on a lot to get it that soft and that absorbent. Uh, but they have some of their own generation behind the meter. So, for example, as they're shaving bark off of a tree, or as they're processing that tree, and they they extract the what's called the black liquor from that. That black liquor, very flammable, very good fuel. And so they will run their own furnace there using bark and using black liquor and other parts um, of, of the tree. Um, so you've got some people doing this already. I, I think the big question is, can a Microsoft, a Google, a Bitcoin miner, can these folks come in and maybe do something substantial? behind the meter, like Dow is going to do in Texas, where they're going to build a small modular reactor. I actually think that Microsoft or Google or some of these big companies will, will actually build the next nuclear reactor before we, Georgia Power, or any other utility in America uh, can build it. I think they will beat us to you know, to the draw here, even though you hear TVA talking about building some GE Atachi reactors like they're building in Toronto or in Ontario. Uh, I really think that Microsoft, Google and these other data center owning companies, they have the financial wherewithal. They need the energy and they want it carbon free. So that's a nice combination. Uh, they may be working with the utility to do it. They may wind up working with us. They may get some special tax credits for doing it. But I think they they will actually beat us to the finish line. Um, and, uh, and I, I, I mean, they, they can do that. They can't sell that energy to their neighbors by law here in Georgia. But they can certainly, they can certainly, uh, and if it's on their property, adjacent to their property, uh, they can certainly use that behind their meter and be able to uh, to be able to offset their energy usage. And in terms of yeah. that, uh, being able to sell to your neighbor, you know, I think for distributed energy and sort of prosumer energy systems of the future, that's going to be an important policy decision to address. Do you like? Are you having those conversations around how do we? review some of the existing rules and regulations to maybe unlock the market and actually take the pressure off the utility having to navigate it. Yeah, it's state law. Uh, it would take, uh, you know, as they say, an act of Congress. It wouldn't take an act of Congress. It would take an act of the Georgia State Legislature to change the territorial law. And I, I frankly don't see that happening because the utilities fear each other, right? If, if you remove this territorial these territorial boundaries, then the electric membership corporations think, oh no, Georgia Power is going to gobble up my customers. Um, and they're fearful that they're going to lose business. And so they don't want to touch it. Georgia Power doesn't want to touch it. The cities don't want to touch it. And the lobbying impact of those three entities, Georgia Municipal Association, rural cooperatives, and Georgia Power, it's, it's, it's pretty difficult for a state legislature to look at those three entities and say, well, you, you don't really want it, but we're going to do it anyway. Uh, I, I just I just don't see it being a political feasibility uh, to do. That doesn't mean that that a utility 
like Georgia Power can't go to a Microsoft and say, hey, let us let us help you accomplish your goals. Let us create some special programs. I think that there'll be more collaboration and cooperation, but I don't see this ter- territorial act uh, being repealed or going away in Georgia. Yeah. Yeah. The challenge of, of uh, passing, passing energy across ba- uh, uh, property lines is a, is a challenge of a lot of places. And, and so curious if you can comment a little bit on in instances where someone is deploying a behind the meter system, solar biomass, in the example that you you described there with international paper, um, and they at times produce more electricity, feed it back into the grid, where where instead of passing it to their neighbor, they're just feeding it onto Georgia Power's grid, so Georgia Power can feed that elsewhere. Given the the massive delta between where we are today and where we need to be over the next six years between now and twenty twenty nine. Can you talk a little bit about net metering rules? Uh, are those favorable today? How do you see those changing, if at all, over the next couple of years to, to help with this, uh, fill that delta? You know, traditionally, and this was was an act of Congress, allowing qualified qualifying facilities uh, that were like international paper that wound up generating excess power, the utility has to take it. There was a day that the utility didn't have to take it. They just say, no, we don't need it. Um, curtail. Um, but Georgia Power would have to take the power now, and they are only obligated to pay them uh, essentially a wholesale uh, a wholesale amount or avoided costs. Um, you know, we have added four cent on solar. If you are in, a, in the solar program, you get that wholesale cost plus a four cent adder um, for solar, but that's not biomass. That's not hydro, um, or anything else that you might utilize uh, to generate power. It's only for solar. It was a special program that we created after my net metering. I had a true net metering, monthly netting pilot that I authored that people participated in. The commissioners did not want to continue that, but they were willing to not go back to the old system of just wholesale. They gave it a four cent adder. So in some ways, we you know we did make progress in that area. Um, I think we probably could bump up that four cent to maybe five or just or just six, something like that, and you know give them some additional revenue. We'll see if that you know if that happens. But um, the qualifying facility rule is is still there. If people generate power, then it has to be purchased by the utility. Um, Congress could certainly change and put an adder. They could change the, the QF rules. Um, I, I don't know that that's that that's going to happen. Maybe, maybe if all of the states, you know, through their U.S. senators said, "We've got to have more energy. We're short." Uh, well, what do you need? We need a better price signal. Change the QF number. Give a two cent adder. Give a four cent adder. Congress could do that, and it would trigger, I think, a lot of development. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm curious too, um, Gareth and I are both, both based here in California and, and as I'm sure you're well aware, we recently transitioned from net energy metering 2.0 to 3.0. Um, and, and so what that's doing is it's making storage a lot more attractive because the time in which the, the grid or, or CAISO, California Independent System Operator, needs the power is, is not necessarily when solar's, solar's uh, producing. And so, uh, one of the things that we're seeing more and more of is companies thinking about electrifying their fleets and being able to use these these battery systems, not just in the, the, the movement of their vehicles, but any excess power feeding it back into the grid. Do you anticipate a, a shift at all in net metering to where, where feeding in during, say, the evening time is more advantageous than other parts of, uh, of the day? You know, I had a chance to meet with Dr. Daniel Violet out at Rolling Energy Resources in Colorado. Um, they recently sold their company to a larger company about their curtailment program for EVs, where they would stop an EV charging, uh, send that signal, and they were actually controlling it with an algorithm. Um, and then I met with Fermata Energy, uh, Dr. David Slutsky up in Charlottesville, Virginia, and they have the contract with LADWP down in LA, the city utility, um, uh, LADWP has three of the Fermata 
uh, energy, V to G, a vehicle to grid chargers in their parking garage and they're testing those own Nissan Leafs, which uh, is about the only vehicle that it doesn't void the warranty on to do this. Uh, now, F-150s you can, but a lot of the cars uh, are st uh, still don't allow this uh, to happen. But to, to your question, I really think um, that after talking to Slutsky and hearing that Nissan Leafs on their program in certain states were making the owner about $1,700 a year um, in, in fees just to be plugged in and just to be accessed even for 15 minutes. Um, so it seemed to me like a pretty good deal. Um, so I think, you know, you take my Nissan Leaf S Plus, it has four times the storage capability of a typical Tesla battery wall. So if we, as we continue to grow these, we've got 40,000 fully electric EVs in Georgia, California, of course, over a million. Um, and we've got another 40,000 cars with a plug. So 80,000 cars with a plug that could be plugged in. Uh, how many of them are Nissan Leafs? You know, probably about, you know, probably about, you know, 10,000 of those in Georgia are Nissan Leafs. So we could be tapping those 10,000 Nissan Leafs for demand response. I do think, and I've asked the utility to prepare something for this. I think they want to do this. Uh, they, their bandwidth, they can only do so many, so many, you know, type of R&D projects at one time. So you kind of have to get in line for these things. But uh, I do think we're going to see the batteries being tapped. We just have to. It represents too much energy sitting in a garage or in a parking lot. We simply, uh, we simply need to be able to tap it in those just those, those fifteen minute incremental period where we really need something just for a short period of time to get through. Yeah, that demand side flexibility is going to be huge, isn't it? And I think it's going to yes. go beyond cars. It's going to be all sorts of equipment and home appliances and all sorts. So very exciting future on that front. So I, Tim, what's exciting you most about either current or future work? What's uh, What's got you really jacked about what's coming in the energy industry? You know, I've been disappointed that EVs have kind of um, slowed down. They've gotten a lot of negative press. I, I hate that. And I really blame it on the third party chargers that are out there. Uh, th these chargers are causing people to, you know, to think, um, maybe I'll just stick with a hybrid. I, you know, I, I'll just wait. And so that's too bad because there's been so much energy, effort, and money invested. Now, as I think about, you know, what I am excited about, obviously getting Plant Vogel online has energized the world. I, I just came from Poland, 17 countries there. And I mean, people were clapping for me. I mean, it's like, I didn't build it. I mean, why are you clapping for me? Uh, but the fact that America's back and building big things and that that this type of condensed energy is so effective, it's carbon free, it's going to help with climate goals. I think that's what I'm most excited about. I mean, had you asked me three years ago, I, I couldn't have said Vogel because we weren't done. But now that we're done, now that it worked, I, I feel like I'm going to I'm going to savor this for a little while. I'm going to savor this moment for a little while. Uh, but I'm also excited about future technology like like hydrogen. I think you know uh, I just I came just 3 months ago from Finland and and Kokola, uh, the port city there across from Sweden. They are doing so much with hydrogen using excess wind power to create hydrogen um, in some instances, splitting methane and creating hydrogen and using the carbon black uh, for various purposes with all the industries in the Coca-Cola Chemical um, Industrial Park taking advantage of that hydrogen. I think a city like that is demonstrating that if you put everything close together, you can get some economies of scale and you can really make something like hydrogen work. So uh, I do think hydrogen is a shiny object. Um, not as shiny as batteries right now, but it's shiny uh, and it will have its day. And I think it's going to be a great resource uh, around the world. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, we've we've been Gareth and I were just out in Germany a month, six weeks ago or so, and and uh, there was a lot of talk at, uh, at the industrial conference we were at uh, around hydrogen. And to your point, early in the conversation, economics still aren't quite there yet, but it, but it's it's it is something that we're we're tracking certainly for industry. Um, Tim, one thing I was, I was just curious your perspective on Georgia. Uh, it seems to be at the right at the top of the list across the across the country as far as growth and manufacturing and growth in in data centers. Uh, we talked about a lot of the impacts on load growth there, but w- why do you see Georgia leading the pack in that front? Is it is it does does the Inflation Reduction Act have anything to do with that? What is what is driving Georgia really being a leader? I think the IRA should get the credit for. Uh, a number of businesses that have come here, including battery recycling business and, um, you know, and, and maybe Hyundai's timing, some some other things. But it's more than that. I mean, I, I just finished up a Zoom on the studio impact in Georgia, Hollywood studio impact in Georgia, and just how many movies are being made here, all the, you know, the carpentry and the craft uh, involved with that. Uh, and all the money that it brings. So you take that Hollywood impact, and uh, on the call we had Trilla Studios, we had Woodville Studios, and they said, you know, we've we've now surpassed New York. Georgia is second only to California. So if if we've got this big Hollywood bank of business, and then you've got our port down there, which is I think fourth in the nation, you've got uh, now Georgia pulling down the lion's share of the IRA money. Uh, uh, and, and and then you've got the advanced nuclear technology that's built here that nobody's built. You, you start adding up all these different things and you go, wow, that's, you know, uh, that's pretty significant. And then you look at having the busiest airport in the U S at Atlanta, uh, Atlanta, Hartsville, Jackson. Those are some substantial assets that, simply have a magnetic effect causing people to want to come here, causing the World Cup to want to come here. And you start layering on all these different things and all of a sudden you're, you know, you're a world-class city and a world-class state. And once you get that momentum going, it, it only gets better. Uh, just in the same way when, uh, when, when an area starts losing business and people start leaving uh, and, and that kind of cascades, then all of a sudden you can, you get, you can have a ghost town there and you can have an impact and you're seeing, you're seeing more and more companies leave California, for example. I mean, just, uh, you know, I was out by the Toyota, old Toyota headquarters out in uh, Torrance, I guess, uh, in LA. And, you know, I was thinking, you know, if, if you're, on the West Coast, as close to Japan as they are, and you run Toyota and Nissan out of your state, knowing how Japanese people love that state and love, you know, going back home, and you cause them to leave for Texas and Tennessee, you're doing something wrong. Um, and you, you, you've got some policies that somehow need to be adjusted uh, when, when you are running people out that really shouldn't be leaving. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, you know, California's loss is certainly our gain. I don't, you know, I love California. My daughter lives in Anaheim. I love going out there. I'm taking a group of Georgia officials out again, this time to San Francisco in November, just to see the future of hydrogen, the future of EV charging. There's so many great things happening in California. And I certainly want to learn from those. It's a great way to, uh, round out the uh, the conversation tim just to finish off we have a few power surge questions um if you could be any energy technology what would it be and why i'm afraid to be nuclear so i'm not going to pick that uh <laughs> you know I, I love uh i love clean technology um i love efficiency I guess maybe I'd be spray foam insulation. Uh, I love spray foam insulation, and it just it just you spray it, it starts working immediately. It works forever, uh, and you, you're saving people money. I, I love spray foam insulation. That's awesome. That's a first. I like that. I like that, and also it you know falls along with how do we uh, come from a 
an efficiency perspective, how do we minimize the load? Because there's a lot of things that we can't minimize the load with data centers and, and manufacturing, but there are areas where we can where we can help uh, uh, minimize the impact. So that's awesome. I love that. Well, Tim, this has been a, a tremendous conversation. I, I'm curious, um, do you have any have any favorite uh, recommended sources beyond your own podcast? Uh, any any books, podcasts, newsletters that that you would uh, highlight for our listeners to check out? You know, I, I subscribe to EE News, and they have any number of different publications from oil and gas to green, uh, and and I really rely on this this publication. It, it, reporters are writing the stories, but they're not your typical reporters. They really have a deep knowledge of energy matters, uh, and uh, so I love keeping up with what's going on. They're shorter stories. They've been bought by Politico now. But it is my favorite source uh, of news, and it's all all related to energy and the environment. That's great. Very nice. um, for anyone excited about hearing more from you, Tim, Energy Matters with Commissioner Eccles, is there anywhere else that they should look out for you? You know, I I do a lot of you know a lot of these podcasts. I speak at fifty Rotary clubs a year. And I'm very involved with our National Association of Regulated Commissioners. So, um, you know, not on TV a lot, but I have a great face for radio. So uh, <laughs> I'll stick to radio. <laughs> That's brilliant. Well, we really appreciate your time. We know you're busy. You've got a lot going on. Congratulations on the new super exciting. And uh, yeah, George is going places. It seems like it's going gangbusters. So keep up the awesome work. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Dan, I really enjoyed that. I think uh, Tim was candid and open and you know, was really transparent around what's working, what's not, where the, where the state is heading and the challenges and opportunities. And I think we've seen this firsthand, haven't we? That Georgia is a very exciting place to be right now. It's got all the ingredients for success and a lot of businesses are looking there because they've got access to talents, they've got access to infrastructure, they've got access to energy today, and they've got... Um, all the ingredients for success. I think part of the risk and opportunity for the state and for the utilities is none of this is possible without access to energy. And as Tim um, alluded to, the big businesses don't just want any energy, they want clean energy. And uh, I think this is, this is the opportunity, isn't it? And also it's huge in terms of the growth challenges. Like, do you wanna just remind us of some of the stats that he shared? Yeah, yeah, I, I I too appreciated his candor, and I think it's really important. We always uh, keep in mind the the policy and regulatory side of things because it is the framework by which all these things operate. Um, it was really interesting to to hear uh, some of what uh, Tim shared as far as between now and twenty twenty nine, which is five and a half years away. Not it's right around the corner in the big scheme of things. Uh, we're going to need another six point six gigawatts, 6,600 megawatts of power in the state of Georgia. And then another eight on top of that is expected um, uh, by 2031. So bringing that total of additional power needed to to 14.6 gigawatts. And to give people a, a flavor of how much power that is, one gigawatt um, is, should serve about 750,000 homes. So we're talking 14 pretty large cities, uh, medium-sized cities, I guess, uh, uh, coming online between over the next eight years, seven years. And uh, and I think the, the really interesting thing is, depending on, I was looking at some of the numbers, depending on um, numbers dating back to 2022, uh, on the order of 14 gigawatts already just within Georgia power as a whole right now. Um, and uh, and I saw another figure that was about 22 gigawatts uh, as of the end of, of 2023. But in either of those situations, that means the total capacity on the grid that's been built over the last 100 years uh, needs to increase by anywhere between 66 and, and 100 percent, which when you think about uh, to get these large scale projects, these these large scale utility projects, the project that Tim highlighted a couple of times, 100 megawatts solar plant. Um, all the way up to the mega nuclear plant um, are going to take anywhere between three and 10 years to to bring online. Three is, I think, if they were to start today is is incredibly aggressive. But uh, 
yeah, that something's got to give and, and uh, more and more companies uh, are going to be looking to supplement, not, not, not deliver all their power needs, but, but supplement that with onsite generation and storage and demand side flexibility. So it's, um, it's a huge challenge. It's an exciting challenge for Georgia. It's an exciting challenge. They're not alone. This is happening uh, across the country, across the world. Um, but uh, yeah, I think there's a, there's going to be a lot of lot of opportunity for for onsite generation and storage. Yeah, and uh, I do like that he's traveling around and he's learning from other states and other countries because I think uh, today um, the regulations and policy may hinder actually meeting those objectives and actually supporting the deployment of more behind the meter prosumer like systems where we can transact energy between one another. I think having that ability to support the grid to scale, provide that flexibility, maybe even allow the utilities to control our own assets and our own resources when the time is needed, but being compensated for that, these are all going to be increasingly important. Um, and it's going to need the policy and regulation to facilitate that at scale. So super interesting. Yeah, it's, uh, well, well, it may not be on the horizon today uh, uh, for Tim and other regulators in, in there. Uh, it's hard to think 20 years ago, nobody was walking around with supercomputers in their pockets either. So yeah. things change quick. Yeah, exactly. Good way to end. Yeah, Very beautiful. Cool. Cheers, Dan. See ya. We receive a lot of questions from business leaders around the world wanting to learn more about the energy transition, what is possible and where to start. So to help you stay informed and up to date on best practices, opportunities, risks and success stories, we created an industry news feed at vector.com forward slash news with all our podcasts, blogs and newsletter. Check it out and connect with Dan, myself and the Vector team to learn more. Cheers and have a good one.